Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for attending CorpCon 7. We're uh, so excited to have everyone here and happy to be back out in the real world again instead of doing a virtual con like last year. Uh, thank you again so much for attending. We really, really appreciate the team here. Uh, they'll be your track to DJ for most of the day. And uh, first up, we have Tim Schultz uh, from Scythe. He's going to give a great talk on Purple Team Maturity Model. Let me give you a hand to Tim. You know? Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that introduction. So this is the first talk I've given in person in two years. So uh, that's what, funny enough, the last time I gave a talk in person was at the Sands Purple Team Summit where I met my now boss, who was not at the time, George Ortiz. So it was kind of fun to uh, mark that two year with another Purple Team talk. This one, a little bit more progress. So uh, this is my first time in the Quad Cities. I've had a lot of fun. It's uh, It's been a great time. We talked, I got to meet a bunch of the other speakers and attendees last night uh, through a series of uh, moving between restaurants and different rooms depending on what closed at a time. So that was uh, reminding me of growing up in Mississippi. So who am I? Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Tim Schultz. I am the adversary emulation lead here at uh, Site. So prior to Site, I've been here since about February now. And I was at, uh, before I was at MITRE, who most of you have probably heard of, especially with ATT&CK. I worked on the ATT&CK evals team with the ATT&CK team. And then uh, also one that you may not uh, have heard of is Sandia National Labs. And so I, between the two of those, I spent about six years doing adversary emulation, although it wasn't quite called that, purple teaming. And so it's sort of uh, culminated into everything that I'm gonna go over today. So a quick roadmap of what we're gonna do here. We're gonna talk about why does purple need a maturity model? And so if you're not familiar with purple teaming, don't worry, I'm gonna go over what purple teaming is, what it looks like, and run you through sort of a quick purple team exercise so you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. And then from there, we're gonna go into what is the purple team maturity model, and then how do we actually apply it? I know that's something that's always fun with models is, well, this is good in a lab, but how do we apply this in the real world? So the first step we're gonna dive into is why does Purple need a maturity model and what is Purple team? So the InfoSec teams of today, to walk through a little bit of history, is that everyone's uh, started with either a blue team or red team. Most companies have blue teams these days or whether it's outsourced or they have a uh, service provider or they have their own internal team. Red teams are something that uh, have existed for a long time, sort of a military background as far as the term, but we see more and more companies today are trying to integrate red teaming, and really what it comes down to is security testing into their uh, into their day-to-day -day workflow. And now, a newer player to the game is cyber threat intelligence. So this is something that the question always comes, why purple teaming, why now? And part of that is the explosion of cyber threat intelligence. If we re remember back when the APT1 report came out, it was, it was a huge set shockwaves throughout the entire community internationally as well because it gave attribution. It talked about all these activities that people knew about behind the scenes but no one was willing to talk about. And so from there we had more and more private companies, private industry uh, have released reports. We had the release of ATT&CK that sort of put those all in a library that everyone could go look through and analyze. I'll talk more about ATT&CK later. But that's sort of where the explosion of adding context to the previous red and blue team attacks. Uh, and so that's where blue teams before were just having to fend off whatever was at their firewall. They didn't necessarily have a strategic plan because they didn't have the data necessary. And same with red teams, it was, and still is at times, up to the creativity of the red team, which sometimes can supersede what adversaries are doing, and that becomes problematic when you're trying to actually give metrics to your leadership teams and drive change in organizations. So, as far as what purple teaming is, it's the culmination of all those together. And so your first purple team experience would be essentially bringing those three teams together. Now I say teams, if you're a small company, this might be just you. This might be you with three hats on, or people that only have uh, one or two InfoSec professionals, they're going to be able to do this by themselves as well. And so 
What we do at Scythe is we have the Purple Team uh, exercise framework. That's sort of our, our introduction to Purple Teaming for people that don't that have never done this before. And so this is where you're going to walk through a six step process, and I've got a nice one on the next slide here, that's got a couple of different predefined goals. That's part of this uh, Purple Team exercise framework that is that first time you're walking through something. And so your exercise coordinator is going to introduce what the test is so the entire test is transparent. That's something that's very different from red teams as well, is that you have a transparent test. If I'm the exercise coordinator, I'm gonna tell you exactly what commands I'm going to run and we're gonna walk through a couple different steps. The first one is a tabletop exercise. That tabletop exercise is going to be the first data point. It's what is the expectation when this uh, when this command is run, uh, what is going to happen? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, so we do have tabletop exercises, and by we, I mean uh, CornCon and Scythe and Bryson, my CEO, was actually running that. I think that I see this one this afternoon. So go sign up. Tabletops are great because you don't have to be a super lead hacker in order to participate and to understand uh, what's going to happen. So that's something that, this is why tabletops are important and, and a part of this, this chain of steps. So that expectation, asking, what do you expect? Is it the EDR, is it going to fire? Do you have another defensive tool or vendor that you're assuming is going to pop it up and alert, whether it's an email or something like that? It's your first data point. Second, uh, the next step is going to be actually running the tests. And so then you have the ability to compare what was the expectation what was the actual test result? And you have those that you can work with leadership to address whether or not uh, if specific tools are working or not. And this is something that you repeat over and over and over again. So I do have a couple other steps in there as far as the, the blue team process, and I wanna highlight that separately. So part of purple teaming is addressing not just the technologies, but also the people in the process. When we're going through a purple team exercise, we are, at, well, in the past year and a half, have mostly been doing it virtually. And so what this means is that you are screen sharing, and oftentimes the challenge with Zoom and some of those is interactivity, which is a really important part of Purple Team. And so what I'll do is I will execute the test after we've recorded the tabletop and say, all right, who is your analyst that would first triage this? And so working from like a three-tier SOC model, we would work with the level one analyst and say, share your screen. Show us the dashboards that you're going to look at. What is this going to populate? And so for one exercise, we they had a firewall lock and they said, this is this URL is not categorized and that would register as that would be an alert. And so at that point, I would take it, I'd go do some just a little bit more in-depth checking to make sure it's not a po false positive, pass it up. And so that's where it would escalate to our level two. And so they stop sharing their screen, level two person gets on and shares their screen. And so you can see how we can evaluate the entire process and especially you can identify gaps if there are gaps in not just your technology coverage, but also as people are trying to respond to ransomware, for instance. I do a lot of ransomware emulations and so time is of the essence there. You need everyone to have a concrete process that they are willing to follow to the letter potentially when you're in crisis mode. So that is what purple teaming and a purple team exercise uh, framework is. You're going through that over and over and over again. It's very deliberate testing. It can be slow and a little bit different than your typical red team test, which is why it can be, uh, some folks might not uh, like it as much. But the value you get from it is really what is important. I mentioned those, those, a couple of those key data points. In addition to being able at the end to evaluate the people process and technology, you also have that feedback loop of, I can rerun the test. For instance, I'm not trying to uh, not show my cards here, and that's something that a lot of times when you are doing security testing, if you're doing pen testing or red teaming, you may not want to reveal uh, what your tests are doing. However, since we are being fully transparent about this, if you do have uh, detection engineers or people that can write new logic to try and detect that test, you can do it in real time. And so that's where the value 
for the business really comes in, and this is from uh, some of the Purple Team exercises that we've done on a recurring basis. We've seen uh, enable, we've been able to get people from essentially 0% detections to 60% in just a couple weeks. So the challenge is, as I've mentioned a little bit, you've probably picked up on some themes here, is that uh, purple teaming, at this point, we talk about it, and it can be a singular exercise. People do it once and are like, great, that's awesome, we're done. And maybe they do it even quarterly. But the, the real issue between this is that teams are siloed, or communities are siloed. And so we see this across red teams, we see blue teams, and cyber threat intelligence. We all have our own conferences to go to, and, and the expertise that we're trying to build within our own, uh, our own environment. And so the challenge is that you're not necessarily going to do that cross-pollination except every quarter or once a year. And so even though the, the, the business metrics and the value that you see are, are very clear. And so all of that comes down to communication and teams uh, if they, especially if they're separate, if they're in separate uh, directorates even, they don't have to communicate, it's optional. And so that's where talking about why we would move towards purple teaming as an actual team, it's because we want to take all of the business value and the justification that we've seen and, and keep it together forever. And so that's what I'm pitching here with the purple team maturity model is the first step is you are going to have a purple team. It is not going to be just an exercise. It is going to be moving past that and taking a team of people, and I would even say potentially in the future, this is going to be the majority of teams because you're going to need people that have a mixed series of expertise to truly defend against the current threats. So that's where talking about the shift in blue teams have their own business case, red teams have their own business case, and that's where I don't want to necessarily say that if you're a large enough organization, you're not going to have the resources, the people, or the need to do all those things. But together, when you are trying to defend an organization as a whole, the purple team is going to be, and having that very deliberate testing and making sure that you're uh, able to figure out where in your defenses have gaps, where in your process you have gaps, that is going to become a mindset that you need to have every day. And so that's why we need a maturity model is to evaluate how do we how do we move from that concept of just having a team into measuring it because that's what that's part of what has gotten purple teaming to where it is now is the ability to measure results and so that's why uh, the purple team maturity model as you'll see we're working on building out a measurable way to look at teams and evaluate how teams are in that process. So I've gone over a little bit of this. This is where we're at currently, is that we have these three separate teams. They're working together sometimes, or when they're forced to at the end of a report, for instance, if you're doing a red team engagement. And so we need to move to all those three into a specific purple team. And so the way we are moving past just purple as a team into specific areas of expertise, because that's always something we need to figure out how, what we're measuring, is these two that I've, I've broken out into threat understanding and to detection understanding. Now, if you're a red teamer or a blue teamer or a little bit of both, you can probably see a little bit of yourself uh, or the expertise in one of these. Now, uh, if you're cyber threat intelligence, you might have a little bit more difficulty picking one specifically. Now, the reason I chose the word understanding for these is because the context, as I talked about, that cyber threat intelligence provides earlier is critical when you are trying to determine what you're going to test because you want to make sure that the adversaries that you're targeting, uh, if you are doing adversary emulation, are going to be adversaries that are going to target your organization. Because if you're picking just random adversaries, that could be good, but everyone has limited budget, everyone has limited time constraints, and so we want to make sure that everything that's chosen has a reason. And so the same with detection understanding. So we tend to write detections and maps, or for the latest vulnerability and throw everything together. I think of David Bianco's pyramid of adversary pain here, and the very bottom of that is indicators of compromise, because they're super easy for blue teams and everyone to integrate, because you have tools that can just, you can feed it in, it'll scan the network for those, and anytime it pops up on an endpoint, it'll squash it. 
But the challenge is those are super easy to change from the attacker standpoint. It's really easy, especially with all the automation that we're seeing and the uh, shift in business case for ransomware developing new capabilities at a uh, pretty rapid pace. You, we have to move beyond that. And so that's where detection understanding is so important, is you need to understand what detections are in your environment and, and what depth do they work. Because that's something that we've seen a lot of teams, once you write a detection, you just assume it works all the time. Even if you push out new detections, if you push out uh, any configuration change, who goes and verifies that all the old stuff still works? And so there are a few projects in place that are looking at how to do some of that. I'll give a shout out to Splunk and, and their attack range project because they've tackled a little bit of that. But that's sort of a key, a key challenge with this is as automation and our infrastructure is scaled, we have not necessarily scaled our testing methods. And so that's really a key thing with, with the understanding behind each of these is making sure that your teams are aware of what's going to actually take place in their environment and choose to be very deliberate with their time and the resources. So as far as detection understanding goes, let's dive into each of these a little bit more. Uh, these are some of the questions that your folks that are working on this are going to ask. What are the log and telemetry sources we have? Everything starts with data. Where are we getting our data? What can we do with it? Can we analyze it? And then what is our process? I mentioned before this is going to be that people, process, and technology. And so all these things are going to inform your threat understanding. What are the adversaries that are targeting our organization or our vertical? And so trying to understand that, bring it all together, is going to be key to having that back and forth between your threat understanding and your detection understanding because it all starts with data. And if you have good data, you have a good understanding of who's targeting your industry, you can go collect samples, you can go do analysis. But if you don't have any of that, you're not going to be able to even start through this process. So as far as actually building out the model, I mentioned we have these two different things. Now we have three different levels. And so the first one that I outlined is deployment. So this is where everyone starts. This is where you get that fancy new shiny tool, regardless of what it is, and you put it in your environment. And it's great. You use it, it's fantastic. It, it gives you either visibility or, or it puts a couple of things uh, into a single dashboard, for instance. But the challenge with that is, uh, and if you've ever seen an analyst screen that has Splunk, you have like 40 tabs open and at, at all times. And so it's, well, we have 10 different dashboards and we have these different things, and, and that's, that's just life, which is fine. But that's where we need to shift up to level two of integration. This is where you're taking multiple tools, multiple processes, and putting them together in order to achieve something that alone they could not. And so that's what's so important about integration is you have to be able to take all these tools as everything's scaled, you gotta fit them together. And then the last level is creation. This is the ability to create your own novel detections, your own novel tests based on your own internal knowledge and integrate them into your pipeline. And so this is the peak level because it does require the most expertise. It requires the most familiarity with the tool, but at this level you're able to adapt with adversaries as they're coming out with new techniques. And so I do have two examples that we're gonna walk through for these specific uh, for these specific detection and threat understanding. So hopefully you're familiar at least with, with one of these. So the first one I'm gonna go over is Sigma. So this is essentially a more standardized logging across vendors. That was something that uh, Florian Roth is the original creator of this project from a couple years ago. Uh, and he releases a lot of free detection, so I highly recommend people check this out if you haven't. And so the first step would be just deploying your Sigma rules into the SIM. Again, this is where you put it in and hopefully it works. The, after that though, after seeing whether or not you have any detections that come as a result, triaging it, and hopefully tuning some, because that's something that's also very challenging, is that everyone's environment is a little bit different. And so after you've gotten all of that initial deployment done, this is where you want to start integrating with your other tools. If you have a sandboxing process, can you run these rules earlier in, uh, before something hits your users? 
this is uh, where you're gonna have to get creative with your current uh, technology stack because you might have tools that I'm not even mentioning up here and they could be part of your pipeline. And so putting all these things together to minimize the amount of uh, people time that need to go in and actually perform the analysis, the triage, things like that, that's really going to allow your organization to scale that much better. And then the last one is deploying, developing new Sigma rules, of course. This is going to be specific to your organization, potentially. Maybe you are able to lock things down in a way that no one else can, and that's where you can essentially have Sigma rules that are uh, a bit oversensitive to environments, and, and that's great. But that's where you need to be able to make those adjustments, and you need to be able to figure out how do we develop this, how do we tune this to our needs, so that uh, it's not a tool that's going to actually take more time to use uh, than it's providing value. Yeah. So with that, we'll shift over to Atomic Red Team for threat understanding. So Atomic Red Team, for those of you that aren't familiar, quick introduction about it. It is uh, Red Canary's open source testing suite. And so it, go, it links to MITRE ATT&CK, which is great, and basically allows you to do singular tests of a specific technique at a time. And so they have, uh, it's got a pretty good uh, community contribution effort going to it. So we've contributed a few ourselves, and uh, just want to highlight, it's, it's a really cool project. And so after you've used it and run it a few times, it's a great way to do that initial running a single test to detect a single detection. And this is, I mentioned before, Splunk's attack range, they use Atomic Red Team uh, to validate their testing. And so after you've deployed that, you've run a couple of tests, you've validated that things work. This is where, again, putting it into your de development uh, pipeline is going to be really important. Because if you write a new test, a new detection, you want to make sure it fires almost immediately. If, see if that logic works, because this, if, if not, then it's going to sit out there, you'll have false confidence. Or if it, oh, it runs too much, then you're going to flood your sock with a bunch of additional tickets that they don't want to deal with. So this is where it's really important to tune those things as early in your testing process as possible. And then the last step is developing, of course, new Atomic Red Team techniques. So this is something that even if you feel that you don't have maybe the expertise to do some of this stuff, I can tell you you probably have pretty unique data. Everyone is getting hit with similar strains of ransomware and things like that, but things do shift slightly depending on uh, depending on where where your organization sits in the landscape. And so, uh, just diving into that a little bit, if you are able to collect new logs at your firewall, for instance, and see if if you if you have have a honeypot or something like that sitting out. You can collect data on who's trying to attack you, even if it's mass attackers just trying to scan the entire internet. And so that kind of stuff can help inform you because, or you might want to figure out who is that that's scanning because yeah. say they did get it, what are they going to do next? That's always the questions that should help inform your testing. And maybe those next steps have been profiled in some uh, CTI report that's been released, but you don't actually have in your testing. There you go, you've identified a gap. And so that's, that's where you can really take the data that you have to build these new techniques. Because oftentimes, uh, it, it tends to be folks that are newer to inf uh, InfoSec, how can I give back or how can I contribute? We have all these experts doing things all the time. And that's why I say there's always variations on things. And so whether it's a different flag, those types of things, uh, you'd be amazed. The Red Canary also releases a threat detection uh, like overall report that I also encourage you to look through, but they showcase different flags that adversaries use when they are running PowerShell commands, and they shorthand things different ways. So if your detection, for instance, has, uh, for PowerShell, looks at, for encoded commands, looks for a fully spelled out encoded command, and somebody uses dash EC instead, is your detection still going to catch that? Those are the types of things that are going to allow you to further build up uh, new tests for your environment. So all of this comes down to communication. The teams need to work together. You have your threat understanding. You have your det detection understanding. But everybody still needs to be working together. 
because that is the point of an actual purple team and a formal purple team is going to be bringing all of this together. So, I've got a little bit nicer one here. And so this is what it looks like. So it's a quad chart essentially uh, with our, well, nine block. And this is essentially allows us to chart our path through it. And that's gonna be really important when you are trying to develop a roadmap. Because that is part of also what we're, we're talking about here is how do we move a team that has been focused into deployment, now they have a path forward. So what do we do about that? How do we get them to integration? How do we get them to creation? And so besides just me giving you philosophicals here, um, I'm also going to walk you through how we would use it. And so I'd like to introduce you to Unicorn Inc. Uh, we have Alex is from the blue team representing the SOC. We have Brooke who is representing the red team. And then Casey is our cyber threat intelligence professional. And so they are gonna be going on a journey of becoming a purple team. So their current roles at Unicorn Inc. is Alex, as I mentioned in the SOC, builds new detections based on the latest indicators of compromise that Casey sends over. Now this is good and this is very common that we see that the cyber threat intelligence folks and the SOC folks tend to work together. Sometimes they're even co-located and the CTI folks are sitting in the SOC. Uh, so this is, this is a really good start to our communications. And we have Brooke who is Surfs Twitter, uses the latest and greatest bypasses and red team tools, and is able to get in every single time. And then we have Casey, who reads every single cyber threat intelligence report that comes out. Now, the challenge with some of this is everyone's doing their job. And so the how do you how do you shift that focus into a singular one team? And like sometimes, you'll, management will do that for you. You are now a team. Congratulations, you're a purple team. Get along. And so they don't know where are we. And so trying to chart this out and figure out how do we shift the roles into an, a common language or common goal that everyone can work together at is really what it comes down to. And so I've outlined here Alex, who remember was our blue teamer, SOC person that pulled into the purple team, uh, now runs new detections by Brooke, our former red teamer, to ensure that they work and to see if they're easily bypassed. This is where you have that communication is key because if it's something that gets bypassed just instantly, the question becomes, should we even deploy this? Maybe I should go back and work on it some more. Also incorporates new de uh, detections for, for new malware that Casey is looking up. And so that's going to be, uh, again, tying the cyber threat intelligence reports. Already done some of this, so this is really just keeping it a step up because it's identifying the techniques. So we've moved up from indicators of compromise up to behaviors. And then also researching integration points because they're currently at deployment. How do we move beyond that? What are things that I use that I can integrate with others in order to make all of our lives easier? So Brooke, our former red teamer, uh, now builds tests to validate detections. So this is going to be, uh, this is key in that it's using your creative mindset to make sure everything currently works. And then also making sure that they're incorporating techniques from the cyber threat intelligence professional that is real malware, that's real data that you can tie to. That's something that's always, I've had uh, challenges getting red teamers to do is because of, you're scoping them. You're, you're, you're forcing them into a box, so to speak, and that, that's something uh, that can be a challenge because most of the time red teamers, uh, and especially if they've been on a lot of, uh, a lot of different engagements, they essentially have, uh, they have no restraints. And it's great, it's fun if you're on that team because you get to use your creativity uh, to the max. But that's where focusing it and channeling it into figuring out how would an adversary adapt from this? How would they use how would that team take what they currently have and build more capability is going to be how your red team will really bring a ton of value to this role. They can still be creative, it's just gonna be a little bit more focused. Yeah. And then anytime, so Brooke is still on Twitter, and anytime they find new techniques from, uh, from Twitter that they think are interesting, pass it on to Alex, who's the detection engineer, to figure out how to create new detections for it. So again, still doing very similar roles that they did before, but they're now doing it as a team. 
And so Casey is going to research attackers that are targeting the unicorn industry. So that, remember before, Casey was looking at every single vendor report, which a couple years ago might not have been too bad. But these days, you have enough reports coming out, it's easy to get overwhelmed, and this becomes a point where you also need to scope your cyber threat intelligence to focus on your industry first. Doesn't mean that those other ones are not valuable, but as far as actual focusing to a specific industry or a specific organization, if you're large enough, then you should do that. And so then, is, as we've already covered, essentially is providing reports and techniques to Alex and Brooke based on what specific technologies malware is using, as well as new, uh, new techniques and zero days that we discovered. And so that's overall how we shifted all the roles. It's not a massive shift necessarily, but it is a mindset shift because it requires communicating with colleagues more than before. It requires really being deliberate in deciding that your cyber threat intelligence person is going to have to go out and look for specific unicorn uh, malware or unicorn threat actors. And so with the joint goals, it does allow you to chart where your way through, uh, through the purple maturity model. And so the other thing I wanna highlight here is that most teams that I've encountered have actually started, they're really high on the detection engineering side of things. And the threat understanding is where they are struggling or trying to figure out how do we do security testing and how do we do, uh, do, do testing against ransomware. Uh, because ransomware has been the driver for almost everything at all. And so trying to chart your team through this, this does allow you, and this isn't going to be necessarily a quick process, so despite you walking through it uh, on, in the presentation, organi organizational change takes a long time. Uh, that's, that's the real of it, and it's going to potentially take months or even years. But this allows you to help chart a roadmap into, and it's generic enough that it allows you to fit whatever you have in it, but also provides guidance in how to move to the next step. So, with that, we have covered all of our three major, what is, what is purple teaming, and then why does it need a maturity model, uh, what the maturity model is, and then how we can use it. So, any questions? Thanks for attending, coming to the uh, morning talks. Some, so part of what I like about purple teaming is that everyone gets to see what we're doing in real time. There's no hiding, and so one test we ran, uh, there were, we figured we found out and helped our customer find out they had an 18-hour delay between when logs were taken on the endpoint versus showing up in the sim. And so we're doing a ransomware emulation, and time is critical. So that would have, you know. That's, you get a phone call before you see it in your sim, which would have been a problem. So, yeah, that was that was probably the biggest thing that we've seen so far. Uh, so they, they, they're a pretty large organization, and so they had a good team, that's the thing. And, and luckily it was a multi-day exercise, so we like ran everything, and at first, it's, well, this is gonna be rough. There's no detections at all. So we're starting from zero, but then everything started coming in, their team, Clearly, have they had a good process and all, and they had good people, and that was, you know, the nice thing is they got the um, the CISO on on the phone. We're like, hey, this happened, and that became priority one was get it done, figure out what if it's an architecture problem, get on the phone with the vendor uh, to figure out if if there's something that they can do to help us with this. But I think driving that change so suddenly is is what was at least good. So yeah, good question. Anything else? I'll still be here afterward. So uh, thanks again for coming and uh, appreciate y'all's attendance this morning. Enjoy the course time.